roses. We'll take a peek at an ancient rose dating back to Julius Caesar. We'll transplant an antique rose to a better place in the garden. And we'll learn how to keep aphids away from our classic roses. It's all about old roses, next on DIY's Growing Roses. Series on growing roses. This is a workshop designed to erase the myth that the world's favorite flower is a finicky one in the garden. I'm Maureen Gilmer, and today we're going to explore old roses. Now, old roses have been cultivated for centuries before modern hybridizing. Some even date back to Greek and Roman times. Claire Martin is the rosarian at the renowned Huntington Botanical Gardens in San Marino, California. So let's join him at the Huntington to give us a little background on old roses. Old roses are roses that have been around for a few years. In other words, there's some def there are different definitions of what makes an old rose an old rose. Here at the Huntington, we define an old rose as anything that was in gardens before 1900. Uh, the American Rose Society defines an old rose as any rose that was hybridized or grown before 1867. Here in the Shakespeare Garden, we plant roses that are appropriate to the late 16th century when Shakespeare was writing his plays. Uh, this particular rose is a rose called the Autumn Damask. It's one of the most ancient of all garden roses you can still grow in a garden. Old roses have all the shapes that uh, modern roses can have, but because they're older, they are not as formal shaped. The beauty of this particular rose is just the fact that there are just so many petals and they're all crinkled around in the bud. It's also the fragrance of this rose. The fragrance of this rose is, is overpowering. It's one of the great roses. Uh, it's actually a rose that was used to make rose perfume in classic times. Rose perfume is produced by oil glands on the petals or around the petals, and it's based on alcohol. So as the day warms up, the fragrance will evaporate. That's why a lot of very fragrant roses don't seem to smell very strongly later in the warm, on a warm day. Roses go back as far as uh, European civilization. Actually, the Sumerians wrote about roses on their clay tablets in cuneiform. The Egyptians described roses and buried roses in their, uh, it, with their mummies in tombs. When we propagate these roses, we actually take a piece from another plant. So when you plant this autumn damask in your garden, you literally have a piece of the original. All through time, people have propagated this as a clone. So you literally have a rose that some Caesar probably pricked his finger on. Josephine grew it in a garden in the beginning of the 19th century at the Chateau de la Malmaison outside of Paris. For the most part, the European old roses only bloom once in spring. They're like lilacs or peonies. They have a glorious spring bloom, but then don't repeat again through the summer. And that seems to be, for a lot of gardeners, a drawback. For me, it's a great advantage because they literally cover themselves with bloom. They, they just explode in color. The great thing about old roses are they come with a history. Like I said before, this is a rose that you can plant in your garden that maybe Jefferson smelled or Josephine planted in her garden. Charlemagne declared that roses should be planted in every garden in the 8th century. So Claire, I understand that there are some old rose varieties that figure largely into United States history. Well, Maureen, one of, the, one of the great old roses is a rose called Harrison's Yellow. And believe it or not, it was first discovered growing on a farm in the center part of Manhattan Island back before the city had taken over all the island. And that's a rose that first was discovered around 1830 or thereabouts. And Harrison's Yellow was a rose that the pioneer mothers liked to take with them so they could grow a little piece for a while, pull up a rooted piece, put it in a can with some soil, put it in the back of the wagon and it would go to the next home site. Actually, you could almost follow the immigrant trail by the plantings of Harrison's Yellow, following them along the Oregon Trail across the country. Thank you, Claire. Now don't go away. We're gonna show you how to transplant an existing old rose to another area of your garden to maximize that once a year bloom. Cool demo garden. And today's how-to demonstration is essential if you want to relocate a rose to another spot in your yard. It's all about transplanting and the extra care needed when digging and uprooting any rose, especially old ones. So let's get started. Now, I really liked this rose. It's just a really cool old-fashioned cabbage rose. You see, there's just tons and tons of petals. It's a really delicate pink, and you really can't get that kind of shape in the modern rose varieties. 
But unfortunately, as you can see, this poor baby is not happy surrounded by all these other plants. You can see that the foliage is dropping of its own accord, which is always a really bad sign. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut back on the top growth of this plant. Anytime you transplant anything, you never want to have flowers on it because it's working extra hard to make buds and flowers. And that takes growth away from its ability to be reestablished in its new location. Now that we've cut back the top part of the rose, our next step is to sever the roots cleanly. So I'm just going to go around the drip line of this plant shovelful by shovelful. And a lot of the rose's roots are feeder roots that exist at or near the top of the soil within the drip line. So we'll get nice clean severance all the way around. You wanna get that shovel way down in there. This will save you a lot of effort. Okay, now we'll see if there are any roots that remain. See how the soil is falling away? That's okay, because it's not causing roots to break. Now my favorite tool for getting underneath a root ball is a spading fork, because I can get it underneath this rose without actually severing roots or doing a lot of damage. Now, I have some burlap. And I'm going to show you an easy trick. Just put it on like that, and then merely drag it. Especially if you don't have the ability to lift heavy things. Now, I've pre-dug this hole over here. This way, this great little French old rose can sit with a lot of solar exposure. Now, there is a lot of controversy about what we do in the planting hole. I learned it the old fashioned way. I'm gonna show you the way I learned it. But I'm sure somebody will disagree with me, but that, that's the thing about roses, is that there's a lot of differences of opinion in the rose world. Now this is a, a typical rose formula granulated fertilizer. Whether it's new roses, old roses, any kind of rose, they all kind of like the same formula. So, I like to put a little in for the future. And so, down in the bottom of the hole where we would like the plant to go, I usually throw a few handfuls of this and work it into the soil really, really well. Now I have a couple other products because it's got some root damage and it's been traumatized getting it out of the ground. We have a little bit of bone meal, which promotes root growth. Then I have ironite. And it's a, see it says turns yellow to green, develops stronger, deeper root systems. Again, we're trying to get this root system healed back to normal and really producing as quickly as possible. So I'm going to add a little bit of this here. And then I want to make sure that the rose is going to be set at the proper depth. I like to see the union above the ground so that there's no chance of rotting or diseases entering through that union. The next step is to backfill in layers. Make sure to really pack down the soil to get rid of any air pockets. The roots that are exposed to air will die. Okay, so when you water, you absolutely want to flood the base of the plant. Now I'm watering at the highest point and allowing it to flow down. I'm doing this because if you water the root ball directly, you risk washing the soil away and exposing more roots. So that's how to transplant an already existing rose in your garden. Next. We'll get a glimpse of a gorgeous wall of old roses and fix one homeowner's problem with aphids. You know those pesky bugs which plague nearly everybody's rose plants. These growing roses. Homeowner Maureen McMorrow loves old roses. She has a beautiful wall that's loaded with them in her backyard in South Pasadena, California. Wow. 
This is so beautiful. Let's start with this. I mean, you've got obviously this huge 30 feet of fence and how, how many varieties have you got along here? There's seven different varieties. And you chose a lot of very soft colors here, I notice. Well, they're all in the same class of rose, the noisettes, and they are all very muted. Their intensity of the color is very similar, and I chose these roses in part for that reason, because I wanted them to grow together and to not be competing in terms of the intensity of the colors. Tell us, what is a noisette, and where does it come from? They were initially bred in the United States in Charleston, South Carolina in the early 1800s. And they, the John Champanese, who initially bred the first one, mm -hmm. bred a China rose, which gives it its repeat bloom. So these are climbing old roses. Right. They're just beautifully displayed and blended, and it's, it's really lovely. And I noticed, I mean, I couldn't help this for people that live in small gardens. These pots, now this is the way to definitely grow an old rose in a pot. This is not a shy pot. You need to have a pot that's large enough for the root system to be mimicking what it would be in the ground. So what variety is this one? This is Mrs. Oakley Fisher. She's my favorite. Mrs. Act. Oakley Fisher. <laughs> Mrs. Oakley Fisher, and she she's an early hybrid tea. And you also have a Cecil Bruner in pot, and this is such a popular rose. So right. tell us what you know about it. I mean, is it it's a 1920s vintage, isn't it? I think so. This is the spray form. You can see the sprays that come up off the top, and people use them to just cut the whole spray and then use it as a bridal bouquet. Very happy, no disease, no problem with it. No. It's just great. No. But with all these beautiful roses, do you ever have problems with bugs? Oh, of course. <laughs> I mean, of course. <laughs> this seems like the most perfect garden. No, of course. You know, I've got aphids over here. You want to see some aphids? I do, I do. Oh. So here's the aphids, and they're right where we expected to find them. Right, right on the new bud there. When you're inspecting for aphids, be sure you look at the buds and the new growth. So I'm going to start with sort of our least toxic alternative. And this has been around for years. Now they finally packaged it as a product, but we used to probably use a little ivory dish soap right. in water right. as an insecticidal soap. And soap, there's something in it that affects the nervous system of insects. Just apply it fairly generally and to the underside. It's really good to do it in the morning so that you have plenty of time for it to dry out before the end of the day. Now to treat a whole hedge of roses like this would take forever with this particular product. So we'll show you another thing that Maureen told us about, and that is to syringe the plant. This also helps to control spider mites, which tend to exist on plants with the accumulation of dust. So cleaning off your roses on a regular basis is really important. So you would do it early in the morning before the sun rises because once the sun hits the plants, it can cause burning on the foliage. And what you want to do is stand back and you notice the tops of the growth there that are red in color. That's where we're most likely to see the aphids. And if you do this maybe once a week during the growing season, try to get it as direct as possible It'll cut down the aphids considerably without using any other products. But now I want to show you, this is, this, I'm sure Maureen loves this too. This is my favorite part. I love this. Oh, just going to let them go. Yeah. Now, we know our aphids are there, and ladybugs are one of the natural predators of aphids. And they also consume a lot of other undesirable bugs like spider mites. So I want to show you, you can buy these at any home improvement store. I'm going to just put them, I'm going to leave the lid open, and I'm just going to leave the whole container down here and let them crawl out at, at their leisure. So if you'd like any more information on beneficial bugs, on old roses, or everything that we did on this show, log on to DIYNet.com. And thanks so much, Maureen. Would you like some ladybugs? Oh, yes. Thank you for letting us come into your garden today. It's been a pleasure. Don't go away. What to do with your roses after they've lost their petals when growing roses continues. Growing roses. 
You know, the best part about old roses is the hips, which is the fruit of the rose. And I want to show you how to harvest your hips. Some of these are already starting to change color. So we're removing the fruits to get a little more vegetative growth. And I'm also going to cut these to nodes right here facing outward from the roof so that when this branch grows further for next season, it'll grow in this direction rather than up against the roof. This is a perfect example of what happens a lot of times when you don't prune the hips, which is that the hip will be produced and then a smaller flower will be produced from one of the next two nodes down. And this flower will never be very satisfying. So I'm gonna take this one off way down here at an outward facing bud so that I know that the growth that's coming looks good. Get this last little one down here. Now we'll take these back to the potting shed and I'll show you what to do with them. So these are the rose hips that we just cut out of that rose. And they're really great to use for a variety of things. Rose hips are a valuable source of vitamin C. You can make jam out of it. It's a great antioxidant, which we see in a lot of cosmetics today. And of course, it's a wonderful medicinal tea. And as you can see, this is really composed of seeds in the center and a fleshy outer covering. And it's the fleshy outer covering that has all the vitamin C in it. Now, if you want to make tea out of it, I just mince it like this. Then you would take that and simply put it with water in a saucepan and simmer it for a while. And then you can pour off the tea and make your medicinal tea anytime you want from your roses in the backyard. There's another thing that's really fun to do with old roses because they're so fragrant. I like to make potpourri out of the petals. So when the rose is way open like this, then this is the time to get the petals off it. You don't want to start with buds and try to get the petals. Now the trick is, is that you want to dehydrate the petals. So you can use a, a grill like this, or you can use a window screen. You don't want them laying on one another or they won't dry properly. You can either put it right in the oven with the pilot light going and leave it there for a few hours. You can put it on a microwave and turn it on high for three to five minutes. That'll do it too. Now, once you get them all done, your final product of dried rose petals will look like this. Now, even though these roses were originally fragrant, my experience has been that a lot of times once they're dried, they don't have that much fragrance. Or if you want to blend your old rose petals with petals from other types of modern roses that don't have much scent, then that will give you a little more range of color. So what I like to do is once they're dried, I put them in a basket or a bowl. And you could add all kinds of other flower petals as well. If you want to dry your rose hips and put them in there too, you can do that. And then the trick that nobody will ever tell you about except me is that we're going to cheat. And this is a rose oil. It's very concentrated oil. And it only takes one or two little drops to scent this much potpourri. So just put those in there like that, shake it around, get in there. And if you like really heavily scented potpourri, put more in. And if you like it more mild, put less in. Then if you have a little sachet bag, you can either leave it in bowls in your house, just like it is here, or you can put it in little bags and put it in special places of your house or give it away as gifts. And every time that it runs out of fragrance, just add a few more drops of rose oil. So as you can see, roses can do a lot more than grace our gardens and beautify our interiors. Now get out there and start growing roses today. I'm Maureen Gilmer. Thanks for watching.